run. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 9. And as you're turning there, uh, I might mention, I mentioned it early, earlier, Adam is uh, his class this afternoon because uh, give everybody a little bit of rest that we were so busy yesterday. And so after we have a good meal, we'll head home. And I'm sure he will want you to be responsible for the assignment that he gave us last week. So, um, you, uh, Ezra chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Ezra chapter 9, in the very first verse. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests, and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to the abominations even of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves, and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down, astonished. And then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the, of the God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee. My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass has grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day, for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land, to the sword, to the captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, Grace had been shewed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in the holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in bondage. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we lift up your name this morning. Lord God, we pray for your help. Lord God, we need to hear from you this morning. We need to be encouraged in, what we, in the work that you've given us to do. Lord God, we pray that you would send your presence this way in the form of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you'd fill the house. Lord, that you'd make us glad to say that we've been uh, in the house of the Lord this morning. God, help your people that are here that they might be fulfilled as well, Lord. That they might uh, leave this place full and satisfied in your word. We ask these things in the sweet and the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on the thought, not really holy. Not really holy. Now, uh, whether we want to accept it or not, again, again, and again, the Word of God calls His people to holiness. It calls us to be different. It causes it calls us to make a stand when no one else will. Now, that's not popular preaching today because we want to live like the world. We want to act like the world. But as long as we do that, we'll find that God's not going to meet with us. That, that He's not going to bless us. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that Ezra uh, had been granted permission from uh, the king uh, uh, to go up and rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. Now, as we'll find, you need a whole lot more than a building to worship. Uh, repairing the temple and building it back up wasn't getting the job done. 
Now, we'll see that, uh, that uh, uh, Ezra stands astonished when he learns the next thing. And the thing was this, is how they intermingled with the world. Now, the reason he was astonished at that is he was down in the worldliness with, uh, uh, in, in the very uh, center of filth, and he had kept himself more separate than the ones who were up in Jerusalem. And he was astonished at that. He had figured that he had, that he had been impacted uh, uh, by, by the worldliness around him more so than they, but the opposite was true. Now, we live in the United States of America, and, and for at least at the time, we have a freedom to live pretty much as we please, and we're more involved many times in the world than the people that live where the gospel can even be legally preached. And we need to stand astonished. Verse 1, now when these things were done, meaning the preparation of the temple, the princes came to me saying... The people of Israel and uh, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves. Now I want you to see he, he makes three people responsible here. First of all, all the, of all of Israel, he says Israel, the people, the whole land, the whole, every tribe, they have not separated themselves. The Levites, the priestly, uh, the priestly uh, family, they have not separated themselves. And even the priests have not separated themselves. Now, have you ever wondered why they waited so long to bring this up? Why not tell him that to start with? He didn't, they didn't believe he'd get the job done. They didn't even think they'd ever have a place to worship. And now the temple was ready and the people weren't ready. And how many times have we come to the house of God? We have a, a pretty good old building here and the building's waiting for us. The building's ready, but we're not ready. See, that, that, that was the problem that they were facing, was it not? That was the problem. They had a place to meet, but spiritually they were not prepared to meet with their God. And they finally fessed up. And what was the problem? They weren't separated. Uh, and notice what the separation included. Doing, <laughs> doing according to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians. Now we won't get too much on each of these uh, uh, each of these uh, uh, peoples, but I, I will say two things. Uh, first, about the Moabites. Now, if you remember, Ruth uh, was a Moabitess woman. Uh, Naomi and her husband went down there and they got involved with the world. Their boys married those women that were from that land, Ruth being one of them and Orpha being the other. And when they got ready to come back, remember Ruth's commitment, your people will be my people. See, you have to give something up. You know, any kind of religion that will teach you that you can lay in the field of this world and still go right on and serve God, listen, you can mark it down. It's not of the Bible. Right. Amen. We've always been called to be a separate people. And, and certainly, that's what was happening here. And we can't really worship without it. That, that's what he was saying. Verse 2, these were the problems. Now, they have taken their daughters for themselves and for their sons so that the Holy Seed had mingled themselves with the people of these lands. Now, the big thing was their, their, their children were intermarrying with the world. You, you know what your biggest thing is that you need to find a, a wife or a husband for your kids that they believe the same as you do? It don't matter. Uh, you know what? It don't even matter what color they are. As long as they believe the same thing as you. Now, let me say this when it comes to race. If they marry outside the race, there will be problems. But I would whole, a whole lot rather them marry a Christian that's outside the race than to marry a lost person that's white as a lily. You see what I'm saying? And the reason I say that, Moses had a problem because he married the Ethiopian woman, remember? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so we, as the Lord's people, 
We don't need, you know what? We don't need them to marry idolaters. I don't need my daughters to marry Catholic men. And I don't mind saying that. You know what the Catholics are? They're idolaters. They worship the cross and they worship the Pope, and they worship all their little saints so-and-sos, they're idolaters, and my children don't need to be involved with idolatry. You know what? They don't need to marry someone who, who's hooked up with the lodge. You know what those people are? They're idolaters, and we aren't to be locked up with it. That's what had brought them down to the point they couldn't worship. You, you ever wonder why sometimes you go home from the house of God empty and every one of us, if we be honest, we say, yeah, that's happened to me. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's because God hasn't met with us, or at least He hasn't met with you. And the reason always is that He doesn't meet with us is because something stands in the way. And what was standing in the way for these people was the idolatry that they had taken in. So we know that the Moabites had a number of gods, and we will find that Orpha went back to them. And the Egyptians also, what the Egyptians' biggest god, they had many, many gods, but really they worshipped the dead. You know what? Big Halloween is coming up. You know what that is? That's the worship of the dead. And you better leave it alone. You know what? I dare say most people don't even know what they're dealing with when they're dealing with it. They think it's something innocent for the children to do. Nothing farther could be from the truth. And, and so we find, he says, you've let these people in. Uh, we've let these people in. And now we have a line that can't even worship God properly. Verse 3. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. Now, I want you to notice a number of things. Uh, first of all, he said he rent his garment. Now, I sat down long ago, and uh, uh, Bella wanted me to try to pick up her and Gracie at the same time. I used to be able to do that. And I squatted down, I was coming up with them, and I couldn't do it anyway, but I heard the seat of my britches ripping. I thought, well, I don't need to get any further. And, and, and so uh, uh, I shut them back down and didn't come up. Well, you know, this suit ain't, ain't the best, but it's one of my nicer ones. And, and, and they had nice stuff. That would be like me taking off this coat and taking it at the seam right here and just ripping it down the side. That's what he did. And, and, and that was a very common thing to show grief in that day. See, it broke his heart that that much sin had gotten into Israel. It broke his heart. And so he, he ripped off his coat and he, and he ripped his mantle, which was the man's head covering for prayer, just the opposite in the modern day. They were to, uh, they were to cover their head to pray and uh, we, the men are not to cover their head. And, and, and so he ripped that and he ripped his garment and then it said he plucked his hair out. Now, you know what? It ain't nothing that hurts as bad as having your hair pulled out. Uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but you, I, and I'm talking about just a few little threads. And, and, and I, I've never experienced that very much, but I have. I, I had a coat one time, and I pulled it over my head because the zipper was stuck and it caught my hair as it, it was going back. And it, it, it took some hair with it. <coughs> and, and, and then, more tender than that, now, I can't get my beard, I don't think I could pull anything out, but could you imagine? You know what, in Psalms 22, it says, well, that's what our Lord endured. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, 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 and so we find that, that Ezra is so stricken by the spiritual condition uh, uh, of the land that, that he inflicts himself and begins to pray. Now, the last thing I want you to notice in verse 2, he said, I stood astonished. Or astonished is the modern English word. It means the exact same thing. Uh, astonished. Now, are we astonished anymore at sin? I, I, I don't think so. When, when we go out into the community, it no longer bothers us. 
Yeah, if you go down and, and, and you're going down land between the lakes or you go down to Paris Landing and go over the bridge, you look to the left where the hotel used to be and what you're going to see on that thing they used to call a beach is nakedness. And we'll run by there and not even bat an eye. You know what? We're no longer astonished. We're no longer bothered. That, that's, what, that's why Israel was so upset. And, and you know what? Lost people, you know what lost people are going to act like? Lost people. Because that's what they are, right? But what about us? See, he wasn't talking about the, the heathens of the land. He was talking about Israel. He was talking about the high priest. It had crept into them. And, and he stood just blown away that that could happen to his people. And we ought to stand blown away this morning that our churches, you know what? You know why we don't experience revival? We're going to have this meeting uh, November the 12th. And, and you know what? You know what will make it a revival if it comes? Us being serious with God. Yeah. Not willing to have this mass in the camp. Not, not compromising anything. That, that, that's where we need to be. And, and so it says that Ezra was just blown away by this. And just astonished and couldn't believe that that was going on in the homeland. Verse 4, Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of God, the God of Israel. You know what? That's few and far between today, is it not? How many people tremble at the Word of God? Few and far between. You know, you know, in the book of Isaiah chapter 6 where the Bible says that the train of God filled the temple. Do you, you, you know why that happened? It's because Isaiah was amazed at the Word of God. He was amazed that God was meeting with him. That's why it happened. You, you know why revival will come? When we stand amazed in the presence of God. That, that's when it will. You know what? When, when the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, come out from among them and be you separate, it means exactly what it says. But we no longer stand astonished. It becomes normal, no more than you're, than you're reading Facebook. Stand astonished at the Word of God. That will bring real revival. That, that will bring something that you can take to the bank and that you can rejoice in when you stand astonished at what the Word of God says to you. And again, I don't think everyone came, only the ones that they did. The rest of verse 4 says, And there were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the Lord God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I said, Astonished, until the evening sacrifice. And when at evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord God and to the Lord my God. Now, uh, there's not a lot about position of prayer in the Bible. I've studied that out over the years. But this is what this is what Ezra was doing. He was doing like this. How many people are willing to pray like that today? If, if Philip, when Philip gets here, if I came down and prayed like that, would you be ashamed of me? What would it be? You, you know what we do to pray? Most people, this is what, if we get down, this is what we do. Nothing is really wrong with this. Although I would say this, it's very Catholic. It's very Catholic. Uh, you know, he was willing to step outside of the norm, was he not? Are, are, are you willing to step outside the norm this morning? Or do you want it as business as usual? You know what? You know what business as usual would do to a church? It'll bring it down. Always, always, always. If, if it's always the same, always doing the same three songs and a prayer, all of it just routine. Listen, it will bring a church down to nothing. 
And so we as the Lord's people, we need to be willing to do more of this. Verse 6. And I said, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee. Now, two things. He said he was ashamed. He was ashamed to shape of Israel with God. And he blushed. You know, to, to blush, you have to be embarrassed. I remember years ago, I, I worked with this girl, and I'm not going to say her name, uh, uh, because uh, everybody would know her. And, and, and she was a sweet young girl, uh, not much older than Adam. And uh, she came to work with me when I managed the home health. And uh, I can't even remember what was said. But we sat around eating lunch. And she said something, and my face just went boof. And she says, I've never seen a grown man blush. And you know, that, that was pretty sorry to hear. And I, I didn't want to embarrass the young lady, but I just got out and finished my lunch in my office. Now, you know what? You don't see that anymore, do you? And you know why we aren't embarrassed at sin? We see it every day. The filth of this media. You know what? I, I really didn't think that the filthy, stinking soap operas could get any worse, and then somebody came up with reality TV, and I, and I stand corrected. We're no longer embarrassed because we expose ourselves to it all the time. We're no longer upset because we've become accustomed to it. We've gotten used to what happens around us. You know what? You, you, you know what the base reason of separation is? That. So that we can stand astonished at sin. That, that, that's the reason for it. And, and we just don't see it that, that today. We just don't have it. We just don't, uh, we just don't even uh, uh, experience it like we once did. But that is how we ought to be. Verse 7, he continues his prayer. Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And our iniquities have we, ha, have we, our kings and our priests have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the land to the sword, to the captivity, to a spoil, and to the confusion of face as it is this day. Now verse 7, Ezra acknowledges that there is consequences to sin. Now, you know what? Uh, as sweet and glorious as our Lord's salvation is, and it is eternal, listen, it's no license to sin. And when there's open sin in your life after you are saved, listen, the results is coming. And, and you know, this is what I found now that I, that, that, that I have a few years on me. It usually comes in your children. You know what? That's a scary thought, is it not? But you know what? Uh, as cruel as that seems, that's a Bible promise. You know, we always want to jump on Bible promises, don't we? Well, how about this one? The sins of the father shall rest on the son to the third and the fourth generation. You know what that is? That's a promise. You don't get no amen on that one, do you? Right. But it's true. And, and, and so we see that, that uh, the prayer that, that Ezra gives is a confessionary prayer, confessing what has happened and the problems that had occurred. Verse 8, Now for a little space have grace been shewed from the Lord our God. The grace that brought the new repaired temple. The grace that brought preaching back to His people. The grace that brought uh, uh, the movement of God. It's back. To leave us with a remnant to escape. Now the remnant had been left in Israel. You know, uh, a remnant ought to stand strong. But they had been so influenced by the world that weren't. You know what? This is a small church. It's a remnant. And what we ought to do is to stand strong. Believe that Bible stronger and more than you ever had before. Be the remnant. But see, the problem with the remnant here is they gave in to the world. They let them all come in. They entered married. And, and, and they took on their little idols. 
Have you ever, did you ever want, wonder what was the first person that bought idolatry into Israel? It was a woman. And it was the prized bride of Israel himself. And uh, it was Rachel. She brought in idolatry. Remember, remember when they were escaping and Laban was chasing them? And, and, and she sat down on the trunk because she had idols underneath it. And she wouldn't open it up when Laban was searching. And the reason why, she had idols in there and she wasn't going to give them up. And after that day, forevermore, idolatry had been something that Israel dealt with. And you know what? Idolatry is still something we deal with today. Whenever I criticize images, you know what? These little angel trinkets is nothing more than an idol. We have no business with them whatsoever. That's something the Catholic Church is. And you know what? When you look at the image, you're not even accurate to start with. You know, you know how many wings an angel has? Six, not two. Right? You ever seen one six in the dollar store? I haven't. And you know why? They don't know what... Well, what they're wanting to do is sell something. Idolatry. It can be with us so, so easy. It can be your job. It can be your truck. It can be anything that the devil can use. It don't have to be trinkets, but a lot of times it is. And, and so we find then that... that he acknowledges this before the Lord God. He says, we have just a small time to escape to give us a nail in the holy place. Now, the holy place was the, the most holy at the very rear of the temple. And that's where they offered the annual sacrifice. And he says, there's a nail back there for you. And you know what? There's a nail there for you too. He's a person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a nail that stands in the holy place. And, and you, you know, we, we live in a day and age today where God's people do not want to be holy. And, and, and a lot of times, if we are, we're mistaken for another group, are we not? Holiness. Holiness. What, what happened to that? When, when did it become a bad word? When, when did it become something identified with Pentecostal people? It is an attribute of God's people and it always has been. We have a nail in the holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Now, let me say this, that God may lighten our eyes. When you begin to see the worldliness out there and the need for holiness in here, you have lighted eyes. You, you know why people allow that mess into their so-called churches today? They're blinded. Remember, as John was writing the Revelation to the to the seven churches in the first three chapters of the Revelation, he said, He that have an ear, let him hear. And you know why? Not everybody has a spiritual ear. Not everybody has a set, a set of spiritual eyes. If they, if they did, that's why we would be disgusted at the nation we now live in. Men marrying men and women marrying women. That ought to disgust, that, that should make us blush. Embarrass us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, but it doesn't. It doesn't. So we as the Lord's people, we are to be holy. We are to be different. We are to act different, present different in every way. Verse 9, for we are bondsmen. What is bondsman? It's a slave. You know, everybody wants to, woo! Ye are bought with a price. Everybody, all oh, the cross of Calvary, the price of blood. Ye are bought with a price. Quote the rest of the verse. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is your reasonable service. Not, not, not miraculous, not notable. It's just a reasonable thing to do. We're bondsmen to Christ. He bought us. He gave us salvation. We are slaves to Him for here and evermore. Why don't we act like it? 
And the reason why is because pretty much we want to do what we want to do. We want to act like we want to act. For we are bond for we are bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but have extended mercy toward us in the sight of the kings of Persia. Now, I, I, I'll interject this and I'm going to move on. Uh, anytime you see the king of Persia, it's always a type unto Satan himself. Remember uh, when Daniel was praying and he said, The king of Persia hath withstood me? What he was really talking about was the devil. Because remember when the angel uh, arrived, he said, An enemy hath withstood me 20 days. He said, I was dispatched on the first day, but the, but the, angel, uh, the angel withstood me. And see, uh, so what he was saying here is, your big problem, your big fighter, is the king of Persia or Satan himself. So the next time you have a temptation to do something, don't you write that off as nothing. Know that it's the king of Persia trying to damage your holiness. Trying to bring you down to the, the aspects of this world. Trying to get you to act like the rest of the world does. Trying to get you to present like the rest of the world does. And he's done it since the beginning. Now, uh, very quickly, I want you to go into Exodus. Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 39. I want to just read a, a verse there. Exodus 39. Uh, Verse 30, Exodus 39, verse 30, the Bible says this, And when they had made the plate of the crown of pure gold, and wrote upon it in writing, like to the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. Now, our approach to Christ, our approach to God the Father, it's always been holiness. Now, what that's talking about in the mercy seat in the back, right across the front, right here, holiness unto the Lord. That's what, that's what that means. It was holiness set before Him. And you know what? It's still expected today. The only way that you can approach God, Jehovah, is through the merit of His Son, Jesus Christ. That brings you to holiness. But listen, that, listen, don't you ever use that as an excuse to live what, whatever you want to do. Now, you know, uh, I fully believe this. If we believe, if we believe the doctrines of grace, God's people are going to persevere. And part of that perseverance is this, continuing to live for Him. Forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together. Looking, acting like, and presenting like Christian people. That is an expectation. So, if it is, the flip side has to be true. And if it's not there, how can we claim salvation? Right? If perseverance doesn't exist, if we don't serve Him as we should, how can we claim the blood of Christ? Holiness unto the Lord. It's always been that way. First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles 16, verse 29. First Chronicles 16 and verse 29. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now I want you to notice two things. Bring unto the Lord the glory. Do His name. How often do you say, Glory unto God? Never. Let's be honest. Do you ever said that? Ladies, I understand that we're to be silent in the assembly, but when you're at home, do you ever say, Glory to the Most High? Because see, whether we want to believe that or not, that's what He anticipates of you. That's what He expects. You know, and if we do that, a whole lot of people are going to start to look at you like you have four heads. But that is an anticipation. That that is what the Lord looks for His people. Now, in, the, in addition to saying glory unto His name, 
I want you to see that. He says, I want you to worship me in the beauty of holiness. You know what holiness is? It's a beautiful thing. Seeing a man look and act like a man is a beautiful thing. You know what? Man, you oughtn't have to be dragged to work. That's your responsibility. Get up and go. Right? That's a beautiful thing. You, you, you know why you have so many families going hungry? It's because men won't get off their backside and do what God bid them to do. Uh, that, that's it. You know what? The women ought to have to be making a living. The Bible says she's to keep the home and raise the kids. That's it, right? In the beauty, in the beauty of holiness. That, that's what we are to do as men. Uh, on, the, on the reverse side, women, you know what? It's a beautiful thing that you be happy and satisfied to stay at home and raise them babies and to nurture the admonition of the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. You don't need a career. Right? Amen or oh me. It's a beautiful thing to be in the will of God. And, and so he says, I want you to worship me in the beauty of holiness. You, you need holiness. You need separation in this present life. Do it. Now, Romans chapter number 6. Let's bring this down to the New Testament. Romans 6, Paul writing to the church at Rome. Uh, I personally believe that the church at Rome was the defector I believe it became what's now known as the Catholic Church. I believe that Paul saw, saw, saw some warning signs of idolatry even in chapter 1 of Romans. Read that this week if you don't believe me. And Paul saw some real issues with that church. I think he knew what was coming. He anticipated the problems that that church would have and, and ultimately why it caved in the way that it did and become what it, what it is today. Romans chapter 6 in verse, uh, in verse number uh, 19, the Bible says this, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of the flesh. Now all my preaching life, and every preacher I've ever known besides me, most teachers, always has to give examples, right? They give examples. And you know why they have to give examples? Did you ever think about that? It's because of the infirmity of the flesh. If I just said worship the Lord and the beauty of holiness, and we said amen and dismissed, you, you know why that wouldn't work? Because of the infirmities of the flesh. We don't understand what holiness is about. So the best of the ability you have to explain it and give it examples. And, and, and that's, what, that's what Paul, as he's writing to the church at Rome, he was really alluding to. He says, listen, I have to get pretty basic with you because you're so worldly. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Now, what is your servants? I have my left and right hand, that's a servant, right? I'm to yield them to holiness. I have a crop of thick, woolly hair. I'm to yield it to holiness. You know, why my, you know why my hair ain't down to my shoulders? And I'll even say this, neither was Jesus's. It's because the Bible is very specific about that for me, and is it not? And so I'll go with the Bible. But you know what? Is it not a temptation? At one time, my hair is a lot longer than it is now. And you know, you know why my hair was so long? I was rebe in rebellion to God. You know, you know why women get their hair cropped off? Because they're in rebellion to God. There's no difference in those two, is there not? And, 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 and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that this comes down to where we live. Worshiping in the beauty of holiness. Yielding to what the Bible says. 
Verse 20, For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye were in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Ashamed. <laughs> if sin is found in your life, are you not ashamed? See, that gets back to old Ezra blushing, don't it? You know, we see some of the filth that goes on in this world and we no longer even blush. Uh, Facebook sometimes calls me to blush. And I'm glad it does, you know. Everybody scrolls. And I was scrolling and it was an advertisement. I hope it was an advertisement. I, I never had seen Well, it certainly wasn't one of my Facebook friends, I'll put it that way. And it's two men made up in the bed together. And I'm, I was so embarrassed, I just blushed. You know, uh, that's where we ought to be. But you know what? If I flipped through there and saw it long enough, you know what? Eventually it wouldn't make me blush no more. And that's the very same way to every sin there is. You, you, you know why it don't embarrass you to see men running around with their shirts off? Because you've seen it so long. We're singed to it. I have a large scar right here where I had some surgery as a child. I don't now here is really, really tender. You know, your belly's kind of tender anyway. And it's real tender right there, but when I get to the scar, I guess you could jab me with a knife and I never even know it. And you know why? Because it, it was singed when I was a child. Back in those days when they cut you open, the scaffold was hot and it burned everything on the way down. It was a way to keep blood loss to a minimum. And we're there. We, we, we need to get that gentleness back. We need to get back to the point where we have some embarrassment. And, and the only way to do that is to present holiness unto our Lord. Holiness to, to, in salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going to read uh, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. The Bible says this. For God had not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Now, do you believe in effectual call? I do, don't you? Because listen, I, I, I heard the gospel I don't even know how many times up to the day that I, up to the time I was a 12 year old boy. But you know, one day it became effectual in my life. The condemnation of sin came, became real just to me. And He called me by His marvelous grace and I was saved. You know what the Bible says? Many are called and few are chosen. You know what? I've been preaching now almost 25 years. I can count the name, uh, the number of people that the Lord has saved under my ministry on one hand. You know why? Many are called, but few are chosen. I don't know how many sermons I've preached in my life. I, I would say bordering probably on a thousand. Five people. Right? Now, if that's true, and it is, uh, then what we have to come to, come to is the redeemed will do this. The redeemed, the truly saved, don't have an issue with this at all because look what the Bible says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. We need to live a holy life. When someone says something smart and ugly to you, you need to answer them with a kind word. That's holy. When, when, when somebody says, listen, uh, can I borrow a cup of sugar? You know, people used to borrow stuff like that. I remember when me and Mama lived in those apartments, people would come by and borrow things. And uh, you know what? Uh, one, one, one time, a woman borrowed a cup of milk from us. And uh, uh, I remember, that's the first time I remember my mom saying this. She said, oh, well, I won't lend it to you, but I'll give it to you. And she sent her on the way with a cup of milk. 
You, you, you see, that's how we need to answer those words. And you know what? It gets hard. But that's holiness. You know, and, and I fully believe that too. We need to look holy. We need to look like men and we need to look like women. But holiness, that the one that really gets the clink is being kind. You know what the Bible says? He says, be ye kind and affectionate one for another. And pray ye one for another. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? I, I think that that's more of an issue for us than coming out and being separate, don't you? You know what? It's easy to have a smart mouth, isn't it? I'm really good at it. And you were saying we get this tongue in check. We need to answer them with kindness. We need to answer them with holiness. You, you know, uh, this is how you can tell someone's genuinely redeemed. The Lord's done a work in your life. It's going to act different. And you know what? If they don't, I don't believe they're saved. Uh, that, you know, just because they've said the sinner's prayer, you know what? That don't do a thing for me, is it you? Watch them. Look at it. Evaluate it. You, you, know, you know how I tell somebody has high blood pressure? I can't look at it and say, oh man, Joanne's way up there today. But if I got my stuff to scope out and my blood pressure cut, and wrapped it around her arm. And you right on. You do good. And so saved people are the same way. So people act like saved people. And lost people act like lost people. We need to be a holy church. We need to, you, you want this revival to be something besides just a little old meeting that we had in the fall of 18. You want it to be a revival? You want to see some folks saved? You've got to be holy. You've got to answer God with holiness. And you know what? If it's not there, and some of us, you know what? It's just not. We need to get upset about it like Ezra did. Yeah. And look for it. Mm -hmm. And look for it.